Another tampered food product draws public attention in China. Shoppers discovered green onions in one market were dyed an intense bluish color to drive up their visual appeal. A look at Beijing's in-depth strategy for swaying U.S. media outlets. Among the tactics, free trips to China for reporters. 30 million are under lockdown in cities nearby Beijing. That's as extreme virus prevention methods are caught on camera. An almost 90-year-old woman faces a prison sentence. Her crime? Practicing a peaceful meditation system outlawed by the Chinese regime. And a U.S. ambassador's trip to Taiwan is canceled. That's as the White House prepares to transition to a new administration. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Fake products are commonplace in China. Now, adding to the list are fake green onions. In one case, Chinese shoppers found they could even wipe the green pigment off the tempered vegetables. More on that story from NTD's Don Ma. Another form of food tempering has emerged in Chinese markets. Green onions were found to have been dyed a bluish green color in order to improve their appearance and attract shoppers. Shoppers made the discovery after wiping down the onions with a napkin. The napkin turned a bluish green color and the vegetable's vibrant color faded. One person pointed out that the dye even turned the water used to wash the green onions bluish green. The dyed vegetables have been found in three cities in China's northern Guizhou province. Some vendors say that the intense color comes from preservatives. But one citizen found that green onions he purchased from self-grown vegetable vendors were not dyed. This isn't an isolated case. It's so commonplace in China that Chinese food health websites have published articles educating people on how to tell if food has been tampered with. One article explained that overly bright colors can be a telltale sign of faked food. For vegetables, it recommends avoiding those that appear unnaturally green. But the use of dye in China isn't limited just to food. In other cases, authorities spray-painted green coloring agents on the ground in lieu of planting trees and seedlings. The technique was used as a quick solution to brighten up a region's appearance. It even happened during the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Authorities spray-painted the ground green in an attempt to impress foreigners coming into the city. Don Ma reporting, NTD News. A Beijing-linked group has been working to sway U.S. media outlets with paid trips to China for reporters. An expert explains that China's comprehensive strategy used to shape how Americans think about the communist regime. A group linked to the Chinese regime has organized trips to China for more than 120 journalists since 2009. The reporters invited came from almost 50 U.S. media outlets. The Chinese group was founded by a vice chairman of the Communist Party's political advisory body. It covered the cost of the trips. That's according to an Epoch Times report citing government filings. The 2011 document shows the group also invited media executives from major publications to private dinners aiming to cultivate a group of, quote, third-party supporters to China. Outlets invited to the trips include The Washington Post, The New York Times, The LA Times, Vox, NPR, and NBC. It's a huge concern that the Chinese government is paying for what's essentially a boondoggle for major um, news organizations in the U.S. Uh, it's clearly they're seeking to influence the biggest uh, news organizations in the U.S., this is something that is contrary to journalistic ethics. When they accept that, their, their objectivity is in question. According to the filing in 2009, the firm assisted or directly influenced the publication of nearly 30 opinion pieces and quotes within over 100 articles. A 2016 Chinese state media article boasted the trips for expanding what it called China's international friend circle. The article went on to cite reporters from the LA Times and Reuters saying how the trips changed their views about China. They want to erase from these, you know, important media how any bad coverage of China. They want to put in its place positive coverage of China so that the U.S. basically remain, continues to remain asleep to the huge threat that's coming from China. 
and they're I think they're quite successful at this. I mean, you do see uh, some negative reporting about China in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, um, but. I don't think that the coverage there is as bad as it would be. Other than the trips, Beijing also paid for inserts in American newspapers and funding the publications through online advertising. Dr. Kaur also detailed another way the Chinese regime achieves positive coverage. It often grants special access for reporters who are more positive about China and restricting visas for those who are not. And they know that if they uh, say something too bad against China in their reporting, um, that they're going to lose their visa, maybe immediately. And if you don't have a visa into the country, um, you know, it's harder to report on China. And so that that creates this huge, powerful effect of positive reporting on China. But it doesn't just apply to reporters. China studies professors and scholars who are often quoted by the media are also targeted. The U.S. Department of Education opened investigations last year into Yale and Harvard. The two Ivy League universities allegedly failed to disclose hundreds of millions of dollars in gifts and contracts from foreign donors, including the Chinese regime. And it's not necessarily Chinese people. You have Americans who make huge donations to elite universities um, who are making a lot of money in China. The universities are now required to disclose their financial links to foreign states to the public but individual professors are not. They get a lot of media coverage around China issues, so, so we really have to be careful um, when we hear from Harvard professors uh, and other high-level professors, whether that's Yale, Oxford. Or Dr. Kors says given the Chinese regime's poor human rights record and aggression towards other countries, the U.S. should keep its distance and not go back to the engagement policies embraced by previous administrations. Penny Zhou, NTD News. China is locking down nearly 5 million more people in a city closer to Beijing. That's as rising infection rates spark concerns. Before the announcement, three other nearby cities had already put 24 million people combined under lockdown orders. The restrictions block people and vehicles from leaving the area. Sijiazhuang City is one of the areas hit hardest by the virus spike in China. These four cities are all located inside Hebei province, which surrounds Beijing. Provincial-level authorities there only reported around 100 new cases on Tuesday. But we can't verify that number independently, as data from China is often known to be underreported. More than the half of the reported cases only came back positive after patients were tested at least three times, sparking worries that patients may be infecting others before they realize or are confirmed to be sick. Now we turn to some of China's most extreme virus prevention measures. With infection rates on the rise, some regions in the country's northern provinces have declared what's called wartime status, similar to what's known as the state of emergency here in the U.S. Videos posted online indicate pandemic control is reaching a whole new level. One clip shows workers in full protective gear sealing the doors of cargo trucks shut. These are the same trucks that transport essential goods across the country. The woman who captured the video says truck drivers aren't allowed to leave their truck cabins until they arrive at their final destinations. It's a move to reduce the risk of spreading infection from one region to another. As for the truck driver's needs like food, drink and restroom access, the drivers are forbidden from making pit stops. Another similar video shows several men in full protective suits are standing in a queue next to a cargo truck. The workers then take turns applying seals to the truck's door as the driver looks on from the inside. Another man standing nearby appears to be supervising the process. The text on his protective suit reads SWAT or SWAT. Hebei province is also suffering amid a growing number of cases. A grand lockdown is now in effect for three of the region's major cities. Truck drivers there aren't exempt from the extreme measures either. One angry truck driver from Hebei province started filming while at a gas station in the Xinjiang region. That's because staff there refused to fuel his truck. The woman working there explained they're following a community rule one that prevents workers there from fueling trucks from Hebei province in the name of pandemic control. Brazilian researchers found a Chinese-made vaccine for the CCP virus is less than 51 percent effective, just barely reaching the mark needed for regulatory approval. Chinese pharmaceutical company Sinovac developed the vaccine. 
In comparison, vaccines developed by U.S.-based drug maker Pfizer and Germany's BioNTech clock in at a 95 percent efficacy rate. The finding marks a major letdown for Brazil. That's because the Chinese vaccine is one of two the country's government has lined up for national immunization. With over 200,000 virus-related deaths, Brazil is one of the world's hardest-hit countries. Nations including Singapore, Turkey and Indonesia have also ordered China's vaccine version. Late-state trials report various efficacy results across different countries. Turkish researchers say the vaccine is over 90 percent effective, while Indonesia reports an efficacy of around 65 percent. Chinese police have a zero-tolerance policy for anyone who disobeys rules during the pandemic. They've already arrested people for using fish nets to try and avoid inspection. NTD's Becky Zhou has the story. One driver in China reportedly had difficulty understanding orders from Chinese police. He also may have had a fever. During his run-in, police officers yelled at him, ordering him to park his car for an inspection. As soon as the driver stepped out of the car, the officers wrapped a fishnet around his head. He was immediately arrested and detained. Those who object or petition the regime are often put behind bars in the name of virus containment measures. I haven't been resettled for seven years and have not received any compensation. Low-level civil servants are basically thugs. They ask you to leave or to petition authorities in Beijing. But once I did so, they detained me for six days and brought me to a black jail. Other residents in China are facing a similar predicament. Ms. Lo says she petitioned authorities in Beijing multiple times since last August. But whenever she and her friends filed the petitions, they were arrested under the pretense of lockdown restrictions. She says they were detained for 11 days last October. Reporting by Becky Joe, NTD News. Now we look to a Falun Gong practitioner in China. She's 88 years old, but was sentenced to six months in prison. Because of her age, Yu Fan Zhuang was kept under residential surveillance since she was sentenced back in December. On top of that, she was fined an equivalent of over 300 U.S. dollars. In a similar case, another woman, 60-year-old Liu Hexiang, was sentenced to three years in prison and fined over $1,500. Now she's detained inside a woman's prison in Jiangxi province. Both ladies are from Nanchang City in southeastern China's Jiangxi province. According to U.S.-based Falun Gong news website Minghui.org, Yu started practicing Falun Gong back in 1996 when she was in her 60s. Falun Gong features a set of five slow-moving meditative exercises, and people who practice follow the three principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. The Chinese meditation system was first introduced in China in 1992, where it spread quickly through word of mouth. But in 1999, threatened by the practice's popularity and emphasis on morality and free thought, the Chinese communist regime began a severe crackdown on the system. After the Communist Party started its persecution, Yu says she tried to expose the lies spread by the Chinese authorities about Falun Gong. She has been since detained several times. Back in July 2020, police officers broke into her house, confiscated her Falun Gong books and some of her personal belongings. The other woman, Liu, happened to be visiting her when the police broke in. Liu was also arrested. Because of her advanced age, she's under temporary house arrest. The court will make its final judgment on her sentence next week. According to Minghui.org, more than 60 Falun Gong practitioners over the age of 60 died due to the persecution as of 2019, while nearly 140 of them over 65 years old were sentenced to prison. Seven of them are over 80, and the oldest was 89-year-old Zhang Xingwei from China's southwestern Sichuan province. He is now serving his three-year sentence at home. Chinese authorities have been confiscating passports from civil servants and employees of state-run firms. Chinese Communist Party officials says it's because of what they call central management in order to deal with the virus. For years, authorities have restricted foreign travel and passport used for civil servants and workers from state-run companies. But amid the pandemic, the practice is becoming even more strict. 
NTD's sister media, the Epoch Times, obtained a leaked document from Xingtai City in Hebei province. It details the strength and restrictions on passports. In April of last year, Qingtai authorities required all counties and districts there to rescind passports from government workers and all employees at state-run companies. Such restrictions are usually due to the regime's fear that citizens can easily go abroad and be exposed to free, uncensored information. Chinese activist Dong Guangping says he believes Beijing may be mostly concerned about one aspect, that Chinese citizens learn how other countries are condemning the regime for covering up the dangers of the virus. That's because it contradicts the regime's narrative. The official narrative claims that authorities successfully contained the disease and that new cases in China are all coming from foreign countries. Now we turn to a Chinese family forced apart by the communist regime. Rights activist Guo Feixiong is urging the Chinese communist regime to allow him to visit his wife in the U.S. Guo's wife has been diagnosed with advanced colon cancer. Guo told Radio Free Asia that he's really anxious about his wife's situation. But Guo can't leave China right now. He doesn't have control of his passport. That's because the state security police confiscated it. Now he can't leave China without permission. Guo said he went to jail twice for freedom and democracy while his wife took care of their two children and worked hard to raise them overseas. He added that his wife campaigned for his release and the ordeal caused her huge physical trauma and psychological stress. He explained that he feels immense guilt over her condition. His wife would need to be cared for by a family member after having her tumor removed. Now we look to a former general in the Chinese military, also known as the People's Liberation Army, or PLA. He refused to obey the communist regime during the Tiananmen Square massacre back in 1989. The defiant commander, Xi Qingxian, just passed away on January 8th at 85 years old. He spent the past three decades partly in prison and partly under house arrest, up until the last day of his life. China's 1989 protests were part of a nationwide movement led by Chinese students. They gathered to peacefully oppose corruption and demand democracy. On the night of June 3rd, Xu commanded the elite's 38th Field Army of the People's Liberation Army. He refused to open fire on civilians. He reportedly said he would, quote, rather be killed than become a sinner of history. Other PLA regiments opened fire in central Beijing, killing thousands of unarmed demonstrators or even more. The Chinese regime has since labeled the movement a counter-revolutionary riot. This is why the military court sentenced Xu to five years in prison. He was also kicked out of the Communist Party. After he was released from prison, he said publicly that he didn't regret obeying orders and refusing to open fire on civilians. The Epoch Times recently obtained government documents revealing that overseas divisions of Chinese state-owned companies and expat associations serve as the Chinese Communist Party or the CCP's outposts. They push the CCP's economic and political agendas outside of China. The leaked documents come from Liu Zhao City, Guangxi Province in South China. In 2017, a CCP delegation of the city visited Russia and Greece. During the trip, the delegation received a warm reception and service from Chinese state-owned enterprises and local Chinese chambers of commerce. Afterwards, Liu Zhao's foreign affairs office thanked the Russian branch of the state-owned companies. In a letter, the office praised the company's contribution to the CCP's Belt and Road Initiative. The company develops sales representative organizations in almost 50 countries. Beijing is putting efforts into building infrastructure projects throughout the world in order to assert influence over other countries. The office also sent a thank you letter to the Greek branch of Huawei. Huawei security has been scrutinized due to its close ties to the Chinese military. Several countries have excluded the company from their 5G networks. A planned trip to Taiwan by the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations has been canceled. It's due to transition efforts for the incoming presidential administration. Ambassador Kelly Kraft was due to visit Taiwan from Wednesday to Friday. But a State Department statement says all travel this week has been canceled. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's planned trip to Europe is also canceled. Pompeo last week announced Kraft's planned travel to the Democratic Island. 
The ambassador would have been the third senior American official to travel to the island in less than six months. The UK announces measures aimed at ensuring that British organizations are not complicit in or profiting from human rights violations in Xinjiang, China. NTD's Trevor Piper brings us more. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab says the measures are a clear signal to China that their violations are unacceptable. The UK says it will introduce financial penalties for businesses that do not comply with the measures. This package put together will help make sure that no British organisations, government or private sector, deliberately or inadvertently, are profiting from or contributing to human rights violations against the Uyghurs or other minorities in Xinjiang. Meanwhile, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee says a centre in Jesus College, Cambridge University, is refusing to talk about the abuses of Uyghur Muslims for fear of causing offence. And it's another example of why the UK and the Foreign Office needs to be clear in demonstrating that dirty goods are one thing, but dirty money is also unacceptable. The UK government says coordinated international action is needed to address the risk of forced labour entering global supply chains. Trevor Piper, NTD UK. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson faces calls to take a harder stance on China. This as the new inquiry says the CCP's human rights violations are worsening. Here's NTD's UK correspondent Jane Wirrell with more. Arrests in Hong Kong and re-education camps in Xinjiang, scenes that put Beijing's human rights abuses to the forefront. And there are numerous more violations, including on foreign nationals, outlined in a new inquiry from the Conservative Party Human Rights Commission. We think of the two Canadians, uh, the two Michaels. Um, the report highlights the testimony of Peter Humphrey, a, a British businessman who, who spent time in, in jail in, in China, and the case of, of Gui Min Hai, who's Chinese-born but is a Swedish national. Uh, so we need to remember that it's not only uh, the peoples of China um, that are suffering, although uh, certainly they're, they're suffering m most of all, but, but actually everybody is, is at risk uh, from this regime. Dominic Raab. On Tuesday, Dominic Raab announced new measures designed to ensure British businesses will not profit from forced labour by Uyghur Muslims. Mr Speaker, we have a moral duty to respond. But many say the measures don't go far enough. Raab did not announce any UK sanctions against Chinese officials involved in human rights abuses. So I believe uh, UK still um, acting very, very slowly. These camp survivors and their account to the reveal what they have told us is absolutely horrific. She says it's no longer a secret that China is running modern-day concentration camps. The UK government faces pressure from both sides of the benches to take more action. Jane Wirrell, NTD News, London. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow. Hi, we're happy to announce that you can also catch us on cable TV now. Millions of households already choose us as one of their trusted news sources, and you can too. You can watch us in Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, and many other cities as well. And if your system doesn't carry NTD yet, you can just give them a quick call and request NTD on your cable provider. Thank you for watching. See you next time.